So we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about the idea of door to unload or early mechanical support as a replacement for door to balloon as the timing metric for acute MI without cardiogenic shock. So a little bit of the shifting gear in what uh, in the topic we're speaking about. Those are my relevant disclosures. So I thought I would start with one patient story. This is a patient who uh, showed up in 2007 with an acute MI, anterior MI, had an LAD PCI, balloon pump, did very well in the hospital in terms of survival, so makes it out of the hospital with an EF of 20%, and then begins a 10-year saga of recurrent heart failure, ICD implant, more and more congestion, escalating drug therapy for heart failure, high-risk PCI two years later for the LAD and the CERC, subsequent readmissions for heart failure, only to come back 10 years later in cardiogenic shock, requiring ECPELA configuration and an EF of 10%. It doesn't stabilize, requires bi-V centromags, and then goes on to cardiac transplant. So this is how you can go from a heart attack to heart failure, and this happens over and over again, but the interventionalist stops right here, shows up here, and then shows up here again. So heart failure is an epidemic. By the year 2030, one in 33 individuals in the United States will have heart failure, and the total cost for heart failure will reach $70 billion in the United States. And heart attacks lead to heart failure. So in the developed world, ischemic heart disease remains the number one cause of death worldwide. We know that over the last four decades, we've seen a significant improvement in MI mortality, but what we've also seen is an exponential growth in heart failure hospitalization, and the two go hand in hand. And the reason for that is that the size of your heart attack matters. So this is more contemporary data from 2016, showing that for every 5% increase in the era of contemporary primary PCI door-to-balloon strategy, we see that there's a 20% increase in one-year all-cause mortality and a 20% increase in heart failure hospitalization, just like you saw with our patient. And the median infarct here for primary PCI, any, any type of infarct, is still around 20, close to 20% of your total left ventricular mass. So comfort is the enemy of progress. That's a classic phrase from P.T. Barnum. And it's important to understand that more rapid balloon angioplasty is not the answer. We've maximized the benefit of door to balloon once we get below 90 minutes, and certainly around the average time we're seeing around 60 minutes. Mortality is flat, but this growth in heart failure is really the target that we're going after. So to change the future, we have to learn from the past. This is a paper from 1971, Eugene Brunwald, Peter Morocco, landmark paper, basically suggesting for the first time that maybe we should be targeting myocardial oxygen demand. But history had a different plan. In 1976, Andreas Strunzig was presenting balloon angioplasty. 1977, first angioplasty occurred. So as a result, we focused on myocardial oxygen supply. But we have to develop new approaches to limit myocardial infarct size. It is our responsibility as interventionalists to start thinking about infarct size as, an, as a readout of our efficacy or our therapy. But there are two major hurdles. One is that we have to engineer a device that can actually rest the heart, that can be used clinically, and we've got to have some data. So for 40 years, people have been working on this concept. Remember the paper from 1971? 1978 was the first dog study using a balloon pump. And since then, multiple investigators from around the world have kept working on this concept of unloading. And the take home message from all these studies was that unloading before, not after reperfusion is required to reduce infarct size. And that's the reason for the shift from door to balloon to door to unload. And remember, unloading is a principle, it's not a pump. So this has been shown with the HEMA pump, with the Impella 5.0, with the tandem heart, with the Impella device, the CP. So we're talking about unloading, however you do it, and when can you do it safely. So we've also just recently published this past week in that Jack issue that door to unload promotes a completely uh, radical concept that it actually changes myocardial biology to the point that the heart changes over 3,000 genes that start to favor myocardial recovery. And a lot of this biology is now being worked out uh, by our lab and other labs. What we also learned was an astounding observation that's published in that paper. These are your mitochondria and cardiac myocytes in the anterior wall of your LV. When you do primary reperfusion therapy, this is what your mitochondria look like. They're swollen, they've popped, they've got blebs forming in them, they are not happy. If you do primary unloading in that same infarct zone, the mitochondria remain completely intact. And what we've seen from the gene expression profile data is that we're actually changing the way the cell uh, actually has metabolism by putting in a pump. So we ran a preclinical trial. The preclinical trial was the idea of primary unloading versus primary reperfusion. And we showed that 30 days after the therapy, there was a more than half 50% uh, reduction in the scar size by late GAD enhancement by CMR as well as by anatomic path. 
And more importantly, we saw that stroke volume, cardiac output, and LV stroke work were all improved 30 days after primary unloading as opposed to primary reperfusion. And here are some of the MRI images. This is if you have a heart attack with no pump and you're in the preclinical study versus if you had a heart attack and a pump inserted. So unloading before reperfusion is actually something that you're all beginning to do. In AMI shock, it supports the concept of door to unload. And the CSI initiative is built on this paper showing that pre-PCI uh, intervention, so if you actually do mechanical support before intervention, you actually get better survival over time in patients presenting with AMI and shock. And remember, there's growing familiarity and success with rapid deployment, management, and removal of the Impella CP under some of the highest risk conditions. I think the talks here at this uh, symposium have shown that you guys do this in CTOs and TAVR and some of the sickest hemodynamic substrates, including cardiogenic shock. And you're doing this about 75,000 times. And so the experience with this technology has grown to the point that we can now do this uh, in the setting of an anterior MI. So the time to test the utility of door to unload is now. Clearly, there's an inherent need for improved outcomes in AMI. It's not about in-hospital mortality. It's about heart failure subsequently. More rapid door-to-balloon times is not the answer. door to alone has evolved over 40 years of science, and it's built on fundamental scientific principles. And we're already unloading earlier and improving outcomes for AMI and shock. So this led to the door to unload safety and feasibility study that was approved. And the study design, as the FDA requested, was to take anterior STEMI patients and randomize them to two groups. Everybody gets primary unloading and then gets reperfusion. But what they asked us to do is to test that concept of unloading before reperfusion. And in one arm, we put the pump in and we waited 30 minutes while the LAD stayed occluded. And then we reperfused. And in the other arm, we put the pump in and we immediately reperfused in those patients. And the end, primary endpoint here is a safety endpoint. And of course, we're looking at some early signs of efficacy as well in the trial. So thanks very much. All right, so I don't think I can really debate Naveen Kapoor. I've known him for a long time. <laughs> and I think also we have similar views on a lot of these things. That's what makes these things interesting. So. I'm going to take a big picture approach here. I think there's, there's some things that we're missing here that I think uh, should also be addressed. All right, okay, so the, the issue here is should door to unloading, this new concept, replace door to balloon, a time tested, uh, a time -tested uh, paradigm? And you know, balloons are more fun, I'll tell you, than unloading. It's a lot more work to unload. I think that's what I was alluding to. We're very good at uh, balloon angioplasty and stenting. Uh, this other concept is certainly something that we all are aspiring to maybe uh, use in conjunction, but certainly it's a little tougher. Why is that coming up? I don't know why, okay. So the real question here is what is the target? And you've all seen this slide. Uh, you know, when the uh, when cardiogenic shock is initiated, we don't really know when that happens. It's a, it's a paradigm, it is a cycle, uh, it is a catastrophe, but it starts with ischemia that can happen uh, and results in systolic dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction. And then as that progresses, you get a hypoxemia, you get uh, this inflammatory response, which is a whole different situation where you have a hypotension that then compounds the whole situation. And we don't really have good therapies for that because ultimately that is more detrimental to the heart as well. So really, we don't know when this starts. We don't know where we are in this process. And we're kind of struggling with a disease process where we just do what we can do. You already saw this slide. This is from five years ago. Naveen showed this, that really with the door to balloon initiatives, we've done about as good as we can. At 90 minutes, we don't really have significant improvement in the incidence of cardiogenic shock. But I'm not sure that that means we give up. Uh, is that the best we can do? If you look at early presentation versus late presentation on the bottom left, you can see that patients who present earlier, those who uh, recognize their symptoms and come to fruition earlier to the cath lab or to the hospital, have an enormous benefit, maybe a 50% or 40% absolute risk, risk reduction um, in mortality and in, in the incidence of cardiogenic shock. So are we missing something here in that, are we just giving up too early in door to balloon initiatives? So as you can see, there are two ways to improve mortality and shock. There is presenting earlier, which makes sense, but it's also hard. Patients have to uh, be aware of their heart condition and that this is a heart attack. Identification of those symptoms and that patient. Activate the EMS system, 911. Transport the patient, the door to balloon initiative. And that leads us to the situation where we need to really tackle patients uh, from when they develop their symptoms, even if it's a false alarm, to fixing their artery. 
And reduction, this will likely re result in reduction in early mortality, heart failure, shock, and long-term mortality. Again, we can also just concentrate on the other part, which Dr. Kapoor was mentioning, which is just to treat the shock. Support devices on unloading, door to balloon time, uh, in conjunction with that, algorithms and systems of care once shock is developed and team approaches. But I will argue that if we do the former better, you won't need the latter. And so I, I would argue that these two things need to be done in conjunction, and we should not give up on the former uh, therapies. If you look at patients who present, half the time, or maybe two hours in general, is spent recognizing symptoms and coming to the hospital. Then on average, another, another obviously 90 minutes or 60 to 90 minutes is spent on door to balloon time in the best of situations. That does not take into consideration transfers of other, uh, other hospital patients. So we're, le we're looking at a two to three hour process of these patients by the time they come to us. And the problem is that shock develops at some point in that, in that uh, time course, and it may already have happened by the time the patient presents. And at that point, you have diminishing re returns of unloading or other, or other mechanisms. And we already know this concept. If we get these patients earlier, their mortality is much improved. If you get them within this golden hour, their mortality is very low. We've known this from the Lytics trials that if you get them within one hour, you don't need primary PCI. And so we have learned this concept earlier, and if you, if you have that, then the patients will likely not develop shock. They will likely not go on to develop heart failure. So I would suggest that that is probably a direction that we should not give up on. So even if door to unloading is correct, there are significant challenges. Defining and identifying cardiogenic shock that warrants unloading is not precise. And that's why I'm mentioning about the, uh, the shock uh, uh, definitions paper that uh, myself and Dr. Barron are co-chairing uh, that should come out probably first uh, quarter of next year. Uh, there are no real-world powered randomized outcome data. Uh, complications of mechanical support may outweigh theoretic benefits. So we're dealing with a situation where we want to put these devices in, and I put them in myself, but we don't know what the effects of bleeding, of the hematomas, of the complications of vascular injury can be on these patients. And we all know that a patient that has a vascular insult in the setting of cardiogenic shock is pretty much uh, not retrievable. Uh, we don't know which devices, if any, fully unload the heart or what degree of unloading results in clinical improvement. So this trial is an important trial, but do we know that we have the devices that on a, on a uh, microvascular level or on a um, um, microscopic level uh, uh, in terms of reperfusion injury can actually do the work that is, uh, that is shown in some of the preclinical data? We don't particularly know that. Cost remains an issue for current devices, and then, of course, maintenance, escalation, and weaning of these devices is still in its infancy. So until then, I would say that we should still focus and not give up on community awareness, systems of care, shortening door to balloon times to remain the priority with a goal of symptom onset of balloon time as low as possible, maybe within an hour. I mean, is it possible? We've done a lot of miracles in, in medical care. Is it possible to really get the community uh, behind this, like we do for stroke, for example? Unloading support on a case-by-case -case basis, early initiation to stabilize patient in pre-shock or shock, and maybe we should move it earlier, but we still need to define that. And certainly later initiation for any patients at risk of developing shock in the next 20 to 48 hours. I would see this as a preemptive strike as well. Patients who we think have no shock right now but may develop it are also patients uh, to be considered. Thank you. All right, so we'll... Uh Continue. So I think that you know the um, it's important to to make sure that everyone understands you know the difference between the term door to support we're using that in the CSI initiative and then door to unload in this trial is not for patients with shock. So just to make sure that people understand that when they're seeing any information that comes out about door to unload. So we talked a little bit about the door to unload safety feasibility study, the design of the study. This was the pilot concept. It's really meant um, basically to vet the uh, safety and feasibility of the concept and to get early signs of efficacy. And you know, it's a radical idea that you would put a pump in a patient having an anterior STEMI, but not so radical. We tried it with CRISP AMI. We tried it with the tandem heart uh, reperfusion injury trial, the TRIST trial. So we as a group have been thinking about this concept for some time. For some people, reason people felt that balloon pump would be fairly benign and would have no uh, major effect uh, and negative effect in terms of risk. But what I also know as a scientist, and we get, uh, we get rejection all the time, so this is an editorial from Eric Bates. I would predict that mechanical preconditioning with a percutaneous LVAD will not translate into successful clinical strategy. And so this is uh, editorial work by guideline writers, so we think these are important debates and conversations to have. Uh, I got this tw uh, tweet texted to me. So this is, uh, this is even more conversation out there. So how in hell's name can that ever work? In the active arm, the vessel is blocked for 30 minutes extra. That is so crazy it cannot possibly work. If the trial is positive, I'll present it as late breaker in a dress wearing a blonde wig. 
If the p-value is less than 0.02, I'll wear a hula skirt. If it's less than 0.01, I will also wear and use a hula hoop. So my girls were wondering why I was taking pictures of uh, girls doing hula hoops off the internet. Uh, this was why. So I'll explain that to them when I get home. But in, uh, in New England, you know, the mantra is always ignore the noise and do your job. And that's how we, that's how we operate in our, in our research laboratory. So ultimately, the proof is in the pudding. And so the pilot study was 50 patients. There's a safety adjudication committee. And if there's a safety signal, trial's ending, right? Enrollment completed in May 2018. All 50 patients are enrolled. We've completed the, the enrollment. The analysis is ongoing now. We should have this data out for you in the fall. And I'll show you two cases that illustrate the concept. So this is a 50-year-old, showed up with no medical history, new onset anterior ST elevation MI. There's all the tombstones that we're all very familiar with, less than six hours of chest pain onset. Patient comes into the cath lab, 937 is case start. Angiogram, micropuncture access. A V-gram using a pigtail shows the anterior wall is hypokinetic. Impella pump is in. That's done by 946. The impella pump is in. It's activated at P8. And by 949, we've got a glide sheath into the radial. So feasibility in terms of timing elements, these are some of the case examples. So now a completely new experience. Impella's in. We're unloading. The LED's occluded. And we get randomized to 30 minutes of sit on your ass. And basically, it's 30 minutes of conditioning. And remember, you can bail out if you think that the patient's not doing well. And I end up talking to Bob or Larry or whatever the patient's name is for about 30 minutes in a very nervous high voice uh, while we're standing there. And then after 30 minutes, wiring this vessel, opening this artery uh, is basically you know, a simple step for us. But take a look at the hemodynamics during the 30 minutes while I was freaking out. So heart rate, 115. There's your LVEDP tracing up above 25, close to the 30 range. This is a full-blown big anterior MI, otherwise known as a BAMI. And after about 30 minutes, heart rate 68. There's your pulse pressure on unloading. Your LVPDP signature now looks like a nice square root. You're down to about 10, maybe less than 10 millimeters of mercury of unloading on that LVEDP. You've got a patient who got five mgs of metoprolol, IV nitro, BiPAPs off, patient's pain-free. I have not opened the artery yet. Now we go ahead and open the artery, and that's just another, I'll put in parentheses, landmark day, because that's the first time I ever sat around and waited for 30 minutes while someone was having an anterior ST elevation, but with a pump in. And so the way to do this is technical feasibility. It builds, it's talking about optimal team dynamics for DTU success. The entire study with a 30 minute conditioning arm after Impella was implanted, 67.48 minutes door to balloon time. So this can technically be done under that 90 minute mandate of door to balloon time. And that's the concept of door to unload. And it really requires your team to basically run these things as practice codes like an ACLS code. I'll show you one more case. So this is a 60-year-old gentleman, hypertension, less than six hours chest pain. There's the ST elevations across the precordium. You can see it in V1 especially. And this patient comes in. There's your proximal LED that's occluded. And then your revascularization after reperfusion. The patient, of course, got the pump put in, uneventful CPLE deployment, door to balloon time 72 minutes, inclusive of the primary unloading. And now, it's important to notice how the echocardiograms look. So this was day three post-MI. And remember, this is our guy who's on his way to developing that heart failure uh, program we talked about. And 30 days later, here's the CMR. And if you're looking at that CMR, that's a lot of subendo scar, right? It's a good amount of scar. And so what is the likelihood this dude's gonna recover, right? Here's his echo day 90. So there's that ejection fraction that went from here. That's the scar at 30 days. 90 days later, this guy's not getting an ICD. Okay, this guy is not going to be on a 10-year uh, commitment to advanced heart failure therapy. And that's the idea of door to unload. It's not about in-hospital mortality. It's altering the trajectory of post-MI heart failure, going from door to balloon to door to unload, to prevent that patient from suffering that 10-year saga that we keep putting our patients through for an large anterior MIs that get uh, revask. And the idea is to take that patient and allow them to recover. And that's the simple concept for door to unload. So it's been a global team of physicians and scientists. I'm certainly not alone in this group, but there are many, many people that I've met who've been working on this for decades who have a lot more gray hair than I do. Some don't have hair. I'll point out near your here. Uh, but basically, we've been working on this for a while, and uh, this is a concept that hopefully we'll have the data for you uh, this fall. So thanks very much. So I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, 
brief here, but can say that I do think that this, these debates are interesting, but really I do believe very much in what Naveen is doing and what the field, where the field is going. I think the, uh, the goal really is to identify these patients and figure out uh, when to institute support. We do need to uh, make sure these infarcts are much smaller and that shock does not progress and does not cause the long-term outcomes uh, that we are um, faced with. Um, the epidemic of heart failure that then fuels transplant that, uh, if they can uh, get that. So I think I'm just going to focus a little bit on uh, the real problems right now, which is where is the data? You know, we have some basic, you've seen this, most of the studies they showed you were in uh, pig models. Um, and so, so there's some basic animal lab data for reduction in infarct size, despite further delay in opening artery. Uh, the shock trial, you know, a lot of these trials that came out are really once shock is already initiated and so it's really too late. Uh, the U.S. Pella data you saw in uh, Naveen's uh, uh, slides uh, suggest improved survival if Impella plays pre-PCI in shock patients, but again, it's a selection bias, right? So these are patients who could get it ahead of time. Um, and Detroit National CSI Initiative, it, it's a good initiative. I think it actually uh, takes all of, our, um, all of our information that we have to date and also how we'd like to take care of these patients and puts it all in one protocol. And I think it is a good protocol to go ahead with, uh, looking at hemodynamics, pre-PCI support, and rapid weaning oppressors, which are deleterious to increase survival compared with historical data. But the real problem with all of these is that there's low strength of the evidence and really a lot of potential risks, and that's the hesitancy in using these devices up front. Um, and, and the hesitancy is not just in the physicians, it's in the CCU, it's downstream, it's in our surgical colleagues, it's in our heart failure colleagues, some of them want to move on to transplant. You saw that in the, in the uh, discussion about the three different people with three different biases and three different goals. One is to move to transplant, one is to move to ECMO, which ultimately moves to transplant as well, and then here we are as international cardiologists trying to recover the heart. And I'm not even sure everybody's rooting for us, besides the patient oftentimes. And these are things that we have to deal with as a culture and as a system. And most of these data are confounded by serious selection bias or team-based aggressive approach, and you really can't read that out. Even the CSI initiative is really, how do we get a really strong team involved and a protocol involved very quickly? And I would argue that that would improve outcomes in almost every disease state that we have. So early presentation, I think, affords much more options. It's likely to reduce ischemic reperfusion injury and ischemic time overall likely to reduce infarct size, likely to reduce incidence of shock, and likely to improve mortality. And we don't really know how much this can happen. So I don't think that we should uh, uh, that, uh, give up on these. And I also think that uh, although what Naveen and others are doing in this field is vital, I would hope that it would be required for a, lo a lower and lower subset of the population. Our, office, our efforts really should be focused here, and I'll, I'll speak to myself as well, because as I'm going through the definitions paper, I would love to have most of these patients in pre-shock or in early identification of shock as opposed to full-blown shock, but really, we're spending a lot of money and spending a lot of time and effort and energy on a disease state that uh, is very hard to move. Uh, and focusing here, I think, would, would eliminate um, need for anything else downstream, just like the golden analytics would and could have avoided primary PCI if we got there. And the randomized control data, uh, I think it will be very interesting to see what Naveen comes out with um, in his study. I, I think that will be very helpful to determine what we can do from an from infarct size standpoint, which ultimately, obviously, uh, will improve outcome in these patients. Um, the randomized control trial STEMI patients at risk for shock or with documented shock undergoing Georgia unloading versus Georgia balloon is needed in order to prove this hypothesis. I guess the question of the unloading of the 30 minutes, is that absolutely vital or not? Uh, do you need that to prevent uh, the infarct size uh, escalation uh, or do you not need that? That's, that's not clear. Um, it sh these trials should be powered for combined efficacy and safety outcomes, including access site complications. As we learn, these kinds of bleeding and other complications do affect mortality. The secondary endpoints have to be infarct size or rejection fraction at a pre-specified time point. What is that time point? Not clear. And I really do want to focus on the definition of shock here. Uh, to, uh, that, that's one of the problems with a lot of these trials is did we properly identify the right patient? These are anterior MIs, not necessarily with shock, um, but probably the ones that will have, you know, 30, 40 percent of their uh, myocardium and jeopardy and result in shock. Um, are, and do we have the devices that can really do this? Are we really moving ahead, uh, hopeful that this will work uh, as opposed to, and then we may have a concept that failed? not because the concept is wrong, but rather because the timing is wrong in terms of technology and identification of the patient. Thank you. Thank you.